which cleaning the temple of God. So let's read together and then I will work through that with you. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and brought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And I want to stop there where he healed them and say, it doesn't say some. He healed them. All that came. And there. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were so displeased. And he said unto them, Haven't you heard this, this saying? And Jesus said unto them, You have never read it out of the mouth of babes and sucklings comes perfect praise. So let's go back to verse 1 there. Well, that is the first part, thank you. So, I want you to understand that in those days, there were, the temple was, it was set up that the Gentiles could come there as well. The Gentiles, let's call them, let's be more modern in our language, the unsaved. God has always had a place for the unsaved in His covenant. Always, from when He made the covenant with Abraham, He said, this is how you'll treat the alien. You will bring him in. It's always been, God's heart has always been for all the nations. When he made the covenant of Abraham, he said, In you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Not just the Jews, not just the believers. All. You see, God's heart is for the lost. He wants to draw them in. Amen. Okay. So it's very easy for the church to get it wrong. They did in this case. They got it wrong. I'll show you now. So Jesus went into the temple of God. Some translations leave out the word the temple of God. They leave the part out because it's his temple. Hello? It's, you following? It's his temple. It's Jesus. It belongs to him. It's for him. It's dedicated to him. It's his temple. And Jesus, but it says in this translation, of God. And he cast all them out that sold and bought, category one. Those that sold and bought. The second category of people that he, or that he threw out is he overthrew the tables of the money changers. And along with that tables, the money changers somewhere went out there. And the seats, chairs, seating, of them that sold doves he chased all of them out so three categories that he's dealing with and i want you to understand there was no problem morally or spiritually for selling or exchanging or selling doves it wasn't a problem that's not it didn't upset jesus that's not what upset him you see because this place where this was sold was made for the gentiles now imagine somebody sitting with a hundred doves in cages. Can you hear the noise? The kur, 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 kur. I love that sound, but if you put all of them together, it's going to make a racket. Am I right? And then you've got a, people lining up to exchange money. And they are, you know, they, they're negotiating. And they're negotiating. You see, the temple didn't want the coins of Caesar. Because they felt that's idol worship because Caesar's face is on it. So they don't want that. They say, that's idol worship. We don't worship a human. We worship a living God. So we want the temple coin, the half shekel of the temple coin. So they would change. But what, what was happening here, it, the exchange rate was exuberant. Something like the Rand dollar. <laughs> you know, 118, 120. It, it was extorting people okay and then there were people selling coke 
and pies. You know, because people are hungry. They're coming from far. Well, it's an opportunity. Let's buy a Coke. Let's buy a pie. Maybe get a cappuccino. You know? It'll be lacquer. And then we go. But this area was made for the Gentiles. They couldn't go past this certain area. And what was happening. So I want you to understand. God's heart is for the lost. Amen. All right? Now this setup was keeping the lost away from God. Couldn't, they couldn't come to the Lord. They can't pray there. He said, my house will be a house of prayer. So they can't experience God. So they were, whatever they were selling, that makes a noise. You know, you know, you've been in a shop. You've been at the thoughts. You know, it, it's, it's noisy. You can't pray in that. You can't focus in that. There's some doves going mull over here. No, I don't want that one. I want that one. Cages flopping open and closed. And, you know, the sound of money. I don't want it. So what they were doing, Jesus says, you've made it a den of robbers, of thieves. What were they robbing the people of? Number one, they were extorting them. Financially, they were robbing them. In the second place, they were robbing them of the glory of God. Many a church today is set up like that. That is unwelcoming to the Gentile. As church, we need to get it right. To tell the lost, you are welcome. You can come here. You see, that, that which we have here as a church says you are welcome and you are loved. Now, just to give you an example, when I just started here, that chair, no, it was this chair, this chair, there was a prominent member of church that was her seat. Her stool, ne? So I invited the heir apparent of Living Word to come and minister here. Nobody knows his face, nobody who he is. And he came and sat in this chair. And just before the service started, the lady came to say, you are sitting in my chair. Now she doesn't know who he is. He could have been this unsaved, lost person looking for a family to belong to and give his heart to God. He gracefully got up, moved two chairs on, sat down. But the setup was, you not welcome. You're not welcome. You see, the Lord walked into his temple. And this is the temple that was there, the physical temple. This is what we call church today. He walked in, and all of what the setup was, the Gentiles are not welcome. we exclusive. We worship there. We're not inclusive. So what we do in Yah, needs to tell the lost, you are welcome. That's why we've got nice coffee going. That's why we're trying to be friendly, welcoming committee at the door, for people to come in, to say, you know what, you are welcome, just as you are. Just as you are. Sometimes I'll, it can be that the church is set up in such a way that if somebody walks in, and their whole face is full of piercing and tattoos, you know, and, and then they look like, you know, they were bred in Hillbrow. <coughs> okay? We squirm. You know, sometimes your face tells more about you than what you want. I don't know if you is, is in that category. Now, I wish my face was in the open book. Who is like that? I, I, I can't play poker. I'll lose all the time because I don't have a poker face. Yeah. You know, people see me like, that, you're happy, you're upset, you're not looking well. You know, um, and church needs to say, listen, not be shocked when they come in. Not be shocked when they, the lost come in. Those are spiritually sick and broken because they're not going to conform to our norms and values. They're going to look like you want them to. It's exactly like the Gentiles. They don't act 
They don't look. They don't wear little cuppies on their head. You can stay here, but we are there. Many a church are money changers. That's all they do. They're money changers. They enrich themselves. Many churches, especially in the African uh, uh, demographic of South Africa, have set up all their churches as a family trust. So all the money goes to the family trust for the benefit of the family. And they take exuberant salaries and they enrich themselves and they live these lavish lives. And, and then they start with social structure and social inter or, or interference by having people play roles. They're robbing people of the glory of God. Many people say, come and exchange. Come buy and sell. Come, come with your gifting. Well, come with what you feel and exchange that. You know, this is the church for the rich. You know that. Please don't give us your coins. We only want leopards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm joking. But a lot of churches are set up like that. See, that's the seats of the doves. Those that doves. Because the poor people had, could only afford doves. So they were, they were set up like that. So now these doves are already overcharged. And they... Buildings and mysticism. Mysterious, mysterious. Yet the word of God is so clear. You and I, your body is his temple. There's nothing mysterious, and nothing mysticism, and it's not a building built with hands. It's his temple. And he wants to come into you, into your life. So, but what he does is the same. The first thing he will drive out is buying and selling. But that's the first thing he'll drive out. You see, a lot of people come to church to buy peace of mind, to soothe their conscience. They just come to church. They've got this habit of coming to church. Now people will think nice of me. My mom will approve. Maybe the Lord will love me now. Maybe his favor will be upon me to buy and sell. Jesus drives that out. Give me that next scripture. You thirst, come to the waters, the Holy Spirit. Come to the Lord. He that has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. 
God wants your heart. He doesn't want you to come here to exchange, to buy, to buy place, to buy favor. That's not what he wants. He wants you. And he wants to drive that out. He wants to drive out everything that says, I need to earn God's favor. I need to act in a certain way. Conduct myself in a certain way. To drive that out. I will give you wine and honey. There's no price to what he has. No price. There's no money that can buy that. The second thing is that he throws over the tables. I want you to understand a table is where we put stuff that are precious or where we put our meals. That's what we put on. That's, that's what we dine on. That gives us sustenance. He walks in and he says, I throw over this table that which you want to exchange. I'll give some money. Just give me a seat. I had a, even an elder from another church come here. Hijacked me for three hours. Talking to me. And all he was looking for was position. He wanted to come and buy, exchange, position. So, the Holy Spirit, you know that the Holy Spirit is inside of you. The day you surrendered your life to Jesus, the day you said, Dear Lord Jesus, I receive you. Maybe it wasn't a conscience day like mine, but there was a time that you know something happened in your life and you changed. And you have become a believer in Jesus Christ. That day the Holy Spirit moved into you. And He is the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth resides in you. Now the Spirit of truth, if we learn to listen to Him, okay, you will know when something is a lie. You will know you can't trust this person or can't trust, not by what you see with your eyes like a mentalist. Oh, now this guy looks shady. His hair is all flatly greased. And he's got pointed shoes, you know. But that's not spiritual. You would know in your heart of hearts, this man is not to be trusted. Or this woman is not to be trusted. Or this person wants to deceive me. You would know. The Holy Spirit will tell you, whoa, stop. Stop. So this gentleman is sitting with me and the spirit of truth is starting to rise up because God doesn't speak to your mind. He doesn't speak to your mind. God speaks to your spirit. God doesn't speak to your logic. He speaks to your spirit. Because it's kind of illogic okay, to see a little cloud like this and say, run, go tell the king the rain's coming. That's illogic. It doesn't make sense. God tell you, uh, why don't you stick out your staff over the waters? I'm going to open the waters. That's illogic. God doesn't speak to your logic. He speaks to your spirit. It rises up and something comes out that is of the spirit. And while I'm sitting talking to this man, it's rising up. This man is looking for position. He's looking for position. He's all the time looking for position. He's bad-mouthing the church where he's an elder at. He's looking for position. So I said to him, sir, we don't have position in this church. We've got function. we got function. You see, God doesn't want to give us position. He, wants, he gives you gifting to function. So where are you functioning? You know, for every volunteer, studies have shown, for every volunteer, four people come to church. When we don't volunteer, when we don't serve in God's kingdom and God's house, we are actually telling the Gentiles, you're not welcome. Our God's not real. I'd rather go to the Hindus because they make Diwali cookies and they share that out. And they wear little bands there. They, they not care about what you say. I'd rather go to the Muslims. I don't know who lives in 20. 
Half past four in the morning, do you hear that? Some guy giving us the market prices. <laughs> you know? The tomatoes at four, five, 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 five. <laughs> and our onions are. Da, da, da. Peter, Peter does it much better than I can do it. He says, Yeah, you ask me to get him alone, let him give you the market prices. Okay. 4 30 in the morning. Does he care that you are sleeping? No. Does he care that you have a baby that is small and he's going to wake that baby up? He doesn't care. To the Gentiles, to the lost, it says his God is real because he's not ashamed. He's not ashamed. But as Christians, we're so sensitive not to offend. The cross is offensive to the flesh. The cross is offensive to this. You know what? This is nothing. It means nothing is going to decay and worms going to eat it up. And it's going to become compost. It means nothing. Your spirit is of far more value. Yet we're so concerned about our flesh. And we don't serve. You see, God wants to throw over those tables that gives us sustenance. Some people, that exchange is their career. It's all about their career. Making money. I know a person that is all about that. It's all about that. And I served him, the Lord, for three years. For three years. After three years, I said, Father, I can't anymore. This man does not want what I have on my platter. And I walked away. You see, the scripture says, do not cast what is precious before swine. Child, I'm calling him a swine. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying he didn't allow the Holy Spirit to turn over that table and get his sustenance from the Lord. He got his sustenance from success and making money and wanting to buy position, wanting to buy favor with money. Jesus wants to turn over that table in our hearts. The next part is the doves. Just go one back. The doves. The seat of doves. Seats is a place where you sit. Right? Seat is a place where you sit. You're in your house, you got your chair. You got your chair in your house where you sit. And then somebody else sits in it. Have you seen how they react when you get close to them? When you come in, they're like, is this your chair? And I must I get up? Must I get up? And they're like, they just want to get out of your chair. Right? They just want to get out of your chair. I was told previously that they, you know, like, if you want to see, I want you to look at the chair in front of you. No names on it, eh? No names. Chair doesn't belong to you. Chair belongs to the Lord. Okay? So we pack the chairs in a certain way. Don't move it around. How would you like it if I come to your lounge and move your chairs around? Would you like that? No, I'm going to put it there and put it there. Like, no. So if you want a big chair, you sit on the side. That's where the big chairs are. All right? These front chairs, these black ones, are actually for the youngsters. All right? Because they, can take a, they can't take so much weight. So all the youngsters, you know, we want them in front. So apparently it was a lady that had written her name on the chair. <laughs> Bought the chair, put it in the church, and it's my chair. Somebody said, well, that's my chair. When I got here, I want to show you how silly this is and how it communicates to the Gentiles, you're not welcome. When I got here, there were two older ladies arguing about their chairs. It was a big hoo-ha. big hoo-ha. She sat in my chair. I put my hand back there. And, my, 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 my. and that's my pillow. That my pillow. So I took all the pillows out. Okay. Goodbye, your pillow it makes it all the makar. Looks like you know, vomit in a tumble dryer. Let's get it neat, yeah. Let's look at making why? Because we want to communicate to the Gentiles out there. You are welcome. We organized, we gen this is clean. It's not a demakar spill. 
And they had this huge fight. Blah, 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 blah. Right. It's not your chair. Chris, in the first service, he, every week he sits, he sits in a different place. I just love it. Where's Chris going to sit today? And he's, uh, <laughs> and he's all over the show. I like that. Yes, we are comfortable and we can find a place that we're comfortable. But if somebody else is going to sit in that, it doesn't get jitterish when you come and you're going to look. My place. Scoot over, thank you very much. You see, seat is an authority place. It's a possession place. All right? Jesus wants to drive out the seats in your heart. Because there's only one throne. There's only one God, and He must have the seat in your heart. You see, if you don't get rid of, you don't allow the Lord to cast out, to drive out, to throw over the seat of jealousy or envy or rejection or your past or your know-it-all and your knowledge and being clever. Well, I am eccentric seat. If you don't allow the Lord to cast that out, There's something missing of him in you. And it communicates to the Gentiles. My God's not real. You see, people are not stupid. People are not stupid. They know. They can look at you and spend time with you. And they find out quickly what's the driving force inside of you. And they quickly find out that you're more in love with your whiskey than with Jesus. You're more in love about going on your boat in the ocean than with Jesus. It's got a seat inside of you. Your family is far more important to you than he is. Your business, maybe your insecurity, maybe your abuse from childhood, is the seat in your heart. And that's far more important to you than allowing the Lord to come in and deal with that. Oh, because it's so sore. I want to tell you something about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's kind. And He's gentle. And He will never hurt you. Never. Amen. He'll never hurt you. But if you've been in an accident, I think I saw a motorbike outside. Whose motorbike is that? Who came with a bike? Hey, welcome, man. And you fall on a tar road and that tar goes into you. When you go to the hospital, what do they do? They scrub it. The nurses, am I right? We're solitaire. They scrub it. Am I right? They scrub it. They, they're getting this cobblestones and the pieces of tar out. Are they hurting you? No. They're not hurting you. They're cleaning you. It hurts though. But the accident hurt you. Do you understand? When you suffer from rejection, abandonment, belittlement, shame, all of that, your whole life, being raped, whatever it is that lies in your past, and you've given a seat in your heart, it hurts you. Now the Lord won't hurt you He'll remove it. But that is removing the pain. And some people are so caught up in their identity of being abused, molested, raped, abandoned, humiliated, whatever it is, that they don't want to give up that seat in their heart. And Jesus can't sit there. I want to show you a scripture. Show me that scripture in a The one in John, please. Herewith I'll talk not much with you. This is Jesus speaking. For the prince of the world comes and has nothing in me. See, the enemy didn't have a seat in his heart. 
there everything that tells you you cannot do it. You are scared of something. You're ashamed of something. You're not good enough. You must achieve. You must perform. You must look like this. Conduct yourself in this way. Otherwise, you don't qualify. That is a seat of the enemy. That's a chair. All that rejection, all that hurt, all that pain, all the insecurities. Are, if, do you know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? I know people, nobody here, I'm saying it off the bat, okay? Nobody here, that train so hard, they break their bones. Why? Why would they train, overtrain so hard that their bones break? Because something inside is driving them. Because they're not good enough if they don't perform at this level. Jesus says, come as you are. Come as you are. Come with all your filthy rags. Come with all your shame and all your guilt and everything that you've done this week and last week and your whole life. Because you can name it all up. And the only one that reminds you of that and any person, I want you to get this, any person that wants to remind you of your faults and comes to accuse you is sitting in the seat of the enemy because the devil is the accuser. Do you follow that? The devil accuses you. Remember five years ago or 20 years ago, you did that. That's the devil. That's the enemy accusing you. Or maybe just because before you drove into church, you had a cigarette. You're standing in worship and the only thing that you hear is, you can't worship because you had a cigarette. That's the devil. That's the devil accusing you. Jesus is your advocate. Amen. He stands in between. He says, whoa, 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 whoa. Can I use the example of cigarette? Don't be too offended. Okay? He says, I paid for his deliverance. I paid for his deliverance. I paid for his forgiveness. Shh. God the Father is the judge. He looks at you and says, you can worship me. It's paid. Amen. You beat your wife five years ago or ten years ago. In a fit of rage. The Lord says, stand up. Stand up, priest. Prophet. Stand up. And somebody needs to hear this. The Lord is laying a second time on my heart. Somebody is caught up in a simple thing that one day they lost their temper with their wife. And now they can't get over it. Stand up, priest and prophet. Stand up. It's paid for. It's paid for. You see, he says, come. Go to that verse 61, please. Now I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul has been joyful in my God, for He has clothed me with garments of salvation. She comes when we come with our good works and everything that we've done wrong. It's these filthy, dirty garments. Okay, because my good works and even you give money to to to, to cancer research and children. That's a nice thing to do. You're a good person. But in God's eyes, it's filthy rags. It's dirt. And what you've done in the last 20 years in ministry counts for nothing. Because suddenly it's become a seat in your heart that you sit in, that you sit in pridefully. I have done this in ministry. That manner becomes rotten. 
There's fresh manna to be had. Fresh. You've got to go there fresh. So you come to the Lord and says, you clothe me with garments of salvation. So it doesn't matter what the accusation, what you see, garments of salvation. He clothes, he takes off the dirty clothing. He takes off everything that you've thought might stand before him in his presence or that keeps you from his presence. And he says, let me put my garment of salvation on you. And he has covered me with a robe of righteousness. Do you know what it feels like to walk in a robe of righteousness? Do you know what it is to stand in the midst of all persecution? And no, God's for me and not against me. I'm standing in righteousness. Not because I'm such a goody two-shoe. Because the exchange has happened. Whatever seat was in here is removed. I've allowed him to come in. Do you know what it feels like when you're standing at a braai and everybody is having the brana vaina? That's brandy in English for our listeners abroad. <laughs> and they're getting intoxicated. And you're sitting there and you're at peace. You're at peace and you can listen to, them, listen to their gibberish and not even participate. Because you're at peace because there's a robe of righteousness. I am not trying to impress you. I'm already favored in heaven. Right, righteousness means in right standing with God. He looks and, at you and smiles. Smiles. Despite your failures. See, unless we don't change, unless we have that seat, we don't allow the Lord to come in and say, Lord, show me what's in here. Because He wants to go into His temple. And if we do not allow Him, we communicate to the world out there, you're not welcome with Jesus. That's what we communicate. It is so important that when where we move, and if God has removed this from our hearts, that it communicates to the world, there's a God that is alive. Amen. Not a statue that's blind and can't hear, but one that has risen and is alive. Look what he's done in me. That's what they need to hear from you. That, without you even saying it, I need to see, look what he's done in you. You see, when you're seated on that throne, when those drinking buddies come along, you will drink with them. When that sexual temptation comes, you'll succumb because you're only thinking of you. When worship time comes, I'll hold on to my chair. Because I'm thinking of me. Why? What the guy going to say next to me or behind me if I start putting up my hands? You know where you stop? You stop here. The minute your hands go past your ears, you're not thinking of yourself anymore. Because you're not worried what the person behind you, in front of you is going to say. You're not worried if it's going to offend them that you are waving your hand or lying on the carpet or crying out or dancing. You're not worried what they think. See, David danced so the people in the street could see his underwear. Now, they didn't have nice jockeys back then, okay? So I don't know how revealing it was or wasn't. Maybe it was a boat flossy, you know? I don't know. And even his missus got offended. You see, you've made a public spectacle of yourself dancing. You know what he says? I don't care what you or everybody else thinks. I will become even more undignified for the Lord. Because I don't belong to you. I belong to him. Amen. That's what David is saying. So when I worship, and, I, and, I, and I'm so worried about 
what's going on around me, or whether I'm clapping in or out of beat, and all of that. I am more worried about what people think of me than to whom I belong. So when you have that robe of righteousness over you, you stop worrying about that. You become free. Stop worrying about your neighbor. You see, that's when we allow Jesus to come into his temple. And you are his temple. He wants to throw out, drive out the buying and selling that we think we must do. He wants to throw out or over the table of the exchange. That which gives me sustenance and who gives me the ability to look right. And he wants to drive out the selling of doves. You see, the doves are the poor people, for the poor people, and those are giftings. You see, all those poor people could afford is a dove. Now I want you to understand, if all you can afford is a dove and you go to the Lord, you say, Lord, here's my little dove. This is all I have. I love you. What's he going to say? No, get another one. Get me four more. It's not good enough. You see, and that's what we do. Because not everybody can make music. Not everybody can speak in front. And maybe your gifting is you have the ability to greet people that they feel like royalty. It's about such a small, it's just a little dove. I can't bring it to God. I can't bring it to the church. I want you to know that you are welcome. If, that is, if your gifting is just that, come, let us train you. You stand at that door and you greet people. You welcome them. My wife tells me I can't do that. My face tells too much. <laughs> Especially when I'm preoccupied. I go into work mode. So if I'm going to work, but I offended somebody the other day. If you know who it is and you see him, tell him, I'm sorry. I don't mean to offend him. I was in work mode. I had to do something on the computer. I didn't notice him. I sat down. I did the work. Oh, he didn't greet me. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't mean to do that. You see, if your gifting in your eyes might be a very small thing, God says, now come. The only thing you can bring is a little dove. Come. Bring that gifting. It tells the Gentiles, you are welcome. Because most people, if I have to have a survey here, I promise you, 90% of you will not know what your gifting is. You won't know. You won't know what your gifting is. Come with that small gifting. Say, Lord, here it is. I don't care what the people say. This is what I can do. Maybe you're good behind the broom. That's your gifting. You've been sweeping since you were six. You know, you sweep like nobody else sweeps. You know, there's nobody that can sweep like you. No. Bring that gift to the Lord. Come serve Him with that. Come serve Him. Maybe you're an encourager. So in a one-on-one, -on -one, you're like, well, I'm not good in groups, but I'm good in one-on-one. -on -one. In bring, let us train you according to the scripture. And then where you go, you serve. And you see somebody despondent in the church. Because I've trained you. I trust you. You go and you go minister to them. And you build them up. Because you know how I do that. Suck it up. Build a bridge, get over it. There's bigger things. Let's go. Is that very effective? Some people it works. Most other people are, oh, he's so bloody insensitive. He's got no feelings. I actually got a letter. He's like a robot. Remember that letter, Rod? He's like a robot. No? I'm sorry. Not my gifting. Whoa, bend over. Let me wipe your butt. 
blush and yes, you pss, pss, pss. Well, you're feeling better now. Not my gifting. But it might be yours and you think it's insignificant. And you know how you know? It's when people always come with their problems to you. If you are healed, remember one, you can never minister from pain. You need to be healed. The seats need to be cleared out. The temple needs to be clean. Otherwise, you're going to minister from pain. And you're always going to feel, oh, you're going to cry with them the whole time. That means you're not healed. The difference between sympathy and empathy. Sympathy is I cry with you. Empathy is because I understand why you cry. Do you, this make sense? You need healing then if you're functioning from sympathy. Because it's unbroken in my inside. Therefore, when you feel the pain, I am breaking because it's pushing on my pain. That's a seat. It's a chair of the enemy in your heart. Jesus wants to move in and clean his temple. Clean his temple. And the, the consequence of that is you become less likely to be offended. You become less likely to be offended. So if somebody doesn't greet you, you're not offended. Or something, somebody does something that you don't like, it doesn't offend you. It doesn't put you in a spin because there's healing there. You get a thick skin without trying to be having a thick skin. It comes naturally because less things bother you because they're not thorns all over your spirit. And every some, some, sometimes, every time somebody does something and they push on that thorn, it pushes into your spirit and now you're reacting and you think you're so right. Just show me one incident where Jesus got offended. He didn't. Why? Because the enemy had no ground in him. If we couldn't get offended. So when they belittled him and spat at him and whipped him and all of that, he didn't get angry. He didn't. He said, Father, forgive them. When they challenged me, he said, well, the... You can follow me if you want to. But remember now, the Son of Man, the birds have a nest and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man doesn't have a, a pillow to rest his head on. He didn't expect certain treatment. The minute I've got the expectation of certain elevated a treatment or favored a treatment, it means there's something seated in my heart that says I need to be treated in such a way. A friend of mine, he went to a conference, and at this conference there were four pastors. They didn't have a lot of money, and they rented a room, and the four of them were sleeping on mattresses on the floor. And he started speaking to them, and while he's speaking to them, he found out that they are the shepherds combined over 500,000 people. And there was nothing for them to sleep on a mattress on the floor. And some people say, well, you've got to give me a bed in my private room, you know. Or else I can't come. They expect the elevated treatment. There's something else seated on the throne of my heart there. Why don't you close your eyes? Bow your heads. Please. Father, we come to you this morning and maybe we, we have not even allowed you to be Lord of this temple. And if you've never given your life to God, if you've never surrendered, I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. I'm not going to ask you to put up your hand. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. But if you have never, ever say, Lord Jesus, Come and be my Lord. If you in your heart of hearts know that you are not saved, where you are, would you just look at me, please? Just look at me. So if you're looking at me, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you're looking at me this morning, then you're saying, 
I want to be saved. Thank you. So we're going to pray together as a congregation. Because we want to invite you. We want to walk with you into the gates of salvation. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus. It is I. And you know me. I come to you this morning. Lord, and I hear the knocking on my heart. And I open the door to your temple. And I receive you in. As my Lord. My Savior. My Redeemer. Come and live inside of me. Holy Spirit. I give you permission. To clean out this temple. Thank you for saving me right now. Jesus, will you give me your Holy Spirit? Will you baptize me with your Holy Spirit? I desire to speak in tongues and to walk in power. In Jesus' name. Thank you that from today on, I am known as a child of God. If you've prayed that for the first time, I want to make sure if you've surrendered your life to the Lord, just look at me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for three people, three souls this morning. Let's say, oh, I want to be yours. Lord, your word says in heaven, the angels rejoice over one. One person that turns towards you. Lord, on this morning, you can open up your eyes. You can look at me. I want you to hear this carefully. Because it's a word for somebody. That he who comes to God must believe that he is and he is a rewarder of those that seek him. Amen. There's a reward with God. There's a, you have to believe this. Lord, I believe that you are a rewarder. I am here for you first, but I believe that you are a rewarder. God wants to do something in your life. There's somebody here that is crying out, Lord, do something in my life. God says, I am a rewarder of those that seek me diligently. Glory, glory, glory. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand? I can bless you and we go for coffee. Would you have your hands in the receiving mode? And I'm not doing this religiously. You know, we're going to do this every Sunday. Bless the people, blah, blah. There's power in blessing. The seven seasons of blessing. This is every Sunday is a season of blessing. That you need to hear that God doesn't want to bless you. He has blessed you.